Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Bigelow. Uh, thank you for coming on really warm, sunny days. It's thank you for coming, although the weather is so nice out, and now it's thank you for coming and braving the elements on your way back out at the end, right? Um, anyway, it's nice to see such a large group here this evening. Um, I want to um, call out a special thanks to our donors who make the events that we try to do here at Bigelow, like this one, possible. Uh, we can't do it without your help and your support, and so thank you again. Um, a finger was waved at me last week for not mentioning that to like us on Facebook. Um, if you do that thing, or I, I was told it's okay to say if your children do that thing or whoever does, I don't do the like us on Facebook thing. So I said, what's that mean? Um, <laughs> please don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded regularly how old I am at home. So uh, Next week is our last, um, our last presentation. And the title of that is, What Happens If There's an Oil Spill in the Arctic? So again, that's next Tuesday at this time. Um, tonight, if I have everything on the list that I got yelled at for not mentioning. Um, tonight, uh, Nicole Price is going to talk to us about, is seafood secure? And I will let her talk about that. Um, but Nicole uh, wears a couple hats here at Bigelow. Um, in addition to being a senior research scientist. She is also the di director for the Center for Venture Research for Seafood Security. Um, I try not to say that more than once quickly. Uh, Nicole got her BA at Connecticut College. Uh, from there, she went to University of Santa Barbara, where she got both a master's and a PhD. Um, I'm saying it right so far. Uh, and then she went to Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Um, and then following four years there, do I have that right? Mm -hmm. uh, she came here to Bigelow. Um, Nicole, uh, among other uh, um, things that Nicole does, Nicole gets to, to travel quite a bit. Some of her work takes place in the Line Islands. If you look on a map where that is, it's more or less in the geographic center of the Pacific, and I'm using that very liberally, just north of the equator, southwest of the Hawaiian Islands. Um, yeah, it's out in the middle there. Um, <laughs> Nicole um, works on seaweed, which is that you've you've seen. There were lots of yes. lots of pictures going by uh, of seaweed and. We didn't come here to listen to me, so I'm going to let Nicole talk from here. <laughs> well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for all of you for coming tonight. Um, those images that you were seeing scroll through before are, were taken by Josie Iceland, who was here as part of the artist in residence program at Bigelow. She took these pictures, not here at Bigelow, but was, um, came to Bigelow to be inspired by the science that's happening here and how that can affect her artistry. That better? OK, great. <laughs> uh, similarly, this uh, piece that you walked by as you came into the building is a product of that artist in residency program, too. So I just wanted to mention that um, while we are all sitting here. So today I'm going to attempt to talk to you about seafood security. That is a very broad topic. I can't possibly cover all of it in a, in a single one hour lecture, but I'm really gonna focus on Maine and some of the issues that we have going on in Maine and how Bigelow is addressing these issues, really trying to problem solve for some of these issues. As we know, the ocean is changing in many ways, um, go as has our institution. So Bigelow has been studying the uh, implications of seafood security for more than 40 years. Obviously, we have moved to locations. We're in a brand new building. I don't know if you're all aware, but there's a residence facility that's being built also for students. And there's a greenhouse that's getting installed this, later this summer as well. So we are ever expanding in our effort to um, 
bridge the gap between uh, science, knowledge, and action. When I talk about seafood security, I mean a couple of things. I mean both is that seafood safe for human consumption? Not only is it safe, but how nutritious is it? So there's that broad spectrum of human health and seafood. And then secondly, is it sustainable, both in an economic sense and in an ecological sense? So we developed the center here at Bigelow to try to bridge the gap between the cutting edge science that we do and action. Because more often than not, as scientists, we find that we put a lot of effort into writing these publications, journal articles. They go into that um, journal that gets a really high impact factor. It helps your career, and then it stays there on a shelf for a very long time, maybe even 10 years before any part of that science gets implemented into a uh, useful setting. And so our Center for Venture Research is going to try, is trying to help speed this process along. It's trying to catalyze this process by linking science with the needs that we're hearing from folks, from industry members, from policymakers, from the general public, and then going out jointly to find the support to get this work done in an efficient manner and get it translated as quickly as possible. So we're looking for science-based solutions to craft informed policy and raise public awareness. And that translation of science for positive outcomes is the key for the success of these centers. And it's actually really challenging, especially for us scientists to do. We have our own language and we know how to speak that amongst ourselves, but we really struggle to put that out into the public. And so I will be attempting to do that tonight and you can all let me know later how well I did. Okay, so for just the first third of the talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about seafood safety and what we're doing at Bigelow. And then I'll focus us on sustainability for the second half of the talk. One big issue um, that's come up recently, uh, more recently, because there have been blooms both in the, the lakes, in the Great Lakes and out on the West Coast, is the effect of harmful algal blooms on the environment and on seafood safety. So we've experienced green algal blooms and red um, algal blooms. And by al algae in this sense, I mean the microalgae, the microscopic planktonic algae that you can't see with your naked eye unless it's a big bloom like this. And it causes major die-offs of sea lions on the west coast, of starfish, and it can cause major invasions of predators that follow along um, and trying to take advantage of that booming uh, resource. What's concerning about harmful algal blooms is that certain species are capable of producing toxins. And when organisms like our shellfish are eating those algae, they absorb those toxins and bioaccumulate it, and those toxins are harmful to humans. So, um, as you can see from these signs, this is an example from Washington State where lakes and um, shoreline fisheries have been closed because of either a um, toxic algae bloom or because the shellfish, the area where people are searching for shellfish is a contaminated area perhaps by a sewage outflow, which can introduce bacteria and viruses into the water that are also unsafe for human consumption. So what is Bigelow doing to help um, identify when one of these blooms may be happening and when seafood may be unsafe to eat? Two, uh, more than two things, at least three things I can mention here. The first is um, we are trying to help develop effective HAB, harmful algal bloom monitoring programs. You would think that this exists already, and, and to some extent it really does, but the taxonomy field is rapidly expanding. It's actually pretty difficult to identify these guys. At the same time, their classical taxonomists who do the identifications are aging and retiring, and they're not getting replaced by uh, necessarily at the same rate. So there's a lack of teaching programs also to develop that next generation workforce. And there are non-traditional methods for identifying um, these algae that didn't exist before. So Bigelow is offering the first US training course on ident identification of harmful algal blooms in the US. That happened this week. So this is very current. And the goal is to at first work with policymakers to help them identify when an algal bloom is happening. And after the funding that supports that program ceases, we'll move into a, 
a, a, a, a service for other industry members that want to come and take the course at Bigelow using our new resident, residential facility that's getting built. We also have other analytical services that Bigelow offers for identifying toxins using really novel methods. So this HPLC method was developed, um, was, uh, Maine was the first state to adopt this method for uh, identifying particular toxins in shellfish as a result of harmful algal blooms. We are the only institution, the only research institution in the US that has FDA approval to do this kind of testing. And we work in close partnership with the main department of resources to help them identify when a closure should happen in Maine. And importantly, for those people who depend on this fishery when it can reopen so that they can get back to selling their resources. This is just an example of two different methods to, te to test for those toxins. Um, and one of them is our new method, and one of them is a more traditional method, and it's showing that they have good agreement. So this is a, a really solid method. Um, it actually has faster turnaround, too, than the more traditional methods. So the closings and openings can happen on a faster timeline. The other cool new thing that we're developing at Bigelow is a new technology to identify in the field, in real time, whether you have a bacterial or a viral infection, either in your either in your cultured species that you're concerned you may have disease transmitted amongst your, your stocks, or you're worried about a human disease being present in your cultured species. So this, what you're looking at here is this little device that holds an iPhone. And this device is only about so big, you can use it at home even is the goal eventually, to take a swab sample put it in the device, and moments later get a positive negative and how much there is of your viral load or your bacterial infection. You could think of it as even being able to test yourself for strep throat in the future at home instead of going to the doctor. This is how big these systems are um, for a benchtop science lab situation, and this is the new handheld device. And so that's something we're developing here. It's really exciting. And in the, the field of food security, um, if you are a wild harvester or a culturist, you can test your, your specimens right away. OK, so now let's move on to the aspect of sustainability. And I wanted to jump to this because the work I was mentioning before is by other scientists at Bigelow. And, and that's my role as the director of the center is to make you all aware of those other activities that are happening. But now I'm going to focus on some of the research that I've been doing um, in the past two years here as I make my way into the, to the Bigelow family. Um, speaking of the Bigelow family, this is a Bigelow baby. Um, <laughs> she was born uh, just about a year and a half ago, a uh, little bit after my daughter was born almost two years ago. So we have a growing, <laughs> growing next generation workforce right here. <laughs> Okay, we are all acutely aware that the human population is expanding at an alarming rate, that there will be 10 billion people on the earth likely by the year 2100. I don't know if you're all aware that nearly 50% of the human population lives within 60 miles of the coastline, and three quarters of our major cities are along the coastline. So we are right up here pressing right against this resource and highly dependent on it, especially in Maine. Um, we've been dependent on our working waterfront um, pretty much since the state <laughs> was developed. And we have watched over the years booms and busts of various fisheries and suffered the consequences of lost fisheries over those, those time periods. Right now, I hope you can see this. I know it's really faded, but just watch for these pink colors popping up here in Maine. We're experiencing a boom in the lobster population along the Maine coastline. Now, once upon a time, it was uh, the lobster populations were so dense here that they would wash up on the shores in two foot high piles. It was considered a, you know, a food for the poor, food for your, your cattle. It, wasn't, or, um, it was not a, the delicacy that it is considered today. So that was back in the 1800s. We're not seeing a boom like that necessarily at this time, obviously, but we are seeing a rise in the lobster population now. Why might that be? Well. Maine is actually fairly exemplary in terms of lobster fishery management as compared to most of the other U.S. fisheries. Long ago, Maine fishermen started notching 
the large females and the tails that are capable of producing huge amount of eggs, you want to throw those back into the population so you're ensuring your next generation. Um, in the 80s, we also instilled a size limit so that at least even for the males and the smaller females, they regenerated, got to reproduce at least once before they were harvested. There are other reasons that we're experiencing a boom potentially in um, the lobster population that aren't so, uh, are, are a result of some negatives. So our cod fishery has collapsed and cod are a major predator of lobsters, which may have released them from this predation pressure and allowed for a boom in the population. They also may be um, more abundant here as a result of some of the warming trends that we've seen. So we all know that global warming is happening. I think most of us agree on that now. Certainly the scientists agree on it. The rate of warming in the oceans is not the same all over the globe. And in fact, in Maine, our water is warming almost five times faster than anywhere else in the world. And that's because our gulf has a certain bathymetry and topography and is very shallow, so it's isolated from major oceanic circulations and it just sits here like in a little kiddie pool, warming up and not getting recirculated. So we're having this extreme rise. Now what I want you to focus on with this little graphic is look down here in the 70s, here's Long Island, New York area, and then watch up here in Maine. You'll see that where the warm colors are, where the lobster population is, is popping up. So in the Gulf of Maine and up in the Maine coastline, since about the 80s and, and 90s, and even more so today, we're having a rise in the lobster population. What scientists suspect is that they're following what we call their thermal envelope. That's a fancy way of saying they like the thermostat setting here. And they're following that, the warmer water north and a little bit offshore. So they like that, those temperatures for reproduction. And what we're worried about is that this rate of temperature rise is not going to stop, it's going to keep going. And these lobsters are here now, but they could just move right on by and keep heading up to Canada. And then we lose a major fishery here in the US and Maine. So there's this anticipated shift in lobster distribution associated with global warming that could happen. Not only that, but the lobsters that get left behind aren't in such hot shape. So further south in Rhode Island, Long Island, Boston Harbor, there's been a lot of incidences of lobster shell disease. Nearly 40% in some instances of the lobsters have this shell disease. We don't really know what's causing it. There's a lot of people working on it. Could be warming, it could be a uh, pollution, it could be a host of other problems, but we, it just adds to the concern that how sustainable is the lobster industry moving forward, and this is worrisome given the almost entire dependence of the working waterfront economy on lobster fishing in Maine at this moment. Researchers at Bigelow and at the Darling Marine Center are collaborating to work on um, how warming water affects lobster development. So they're looking not only at warming water, but ocean acidification, which is a problem I'm gonna to get to later. Don't worry, I'm not gonna spend the whole time here talking about problems, I am going to get to some solutions. <laughs> but the lobster larvae don't develop as well, they develop slower in warmer waters. And Jess Waller is a graduate student who's been doing some work here at Bigelow, and I just wanna point out, she has won an award for these images that she took, aren't they beautiful? and it's getting published in a journal not too long from now, if it hasn't already. So all of these things beg the question, is our wild harvested seafood sustainable? Never mind the environmental global pressure issues, overfishing and pollution, all of these things have really done some damage to our stocks, and we're seeing that there's a, a kind of asymptote there, or a, um, a maximum amount that we're able to uh, harvest from the ocean at this point. And in order to make up the difference in the demand for seafood from our growing human population, aquaculture has been introduced and is on the rise. 
So is that growth in aquaculture sustainable and could it be enough to meet the demand? Well, I can't answer all those questions right now, but I do want to give you a little primer on aquaculture and where U.S. fits into the picture. So aquaculture is a pretty efficient way of producing food, actually. So these here numbers represent how many grams of feed goes into a, one of these um, consumables versus how much you get out per that gram of feed that goes in. Beef cattle is not very efficient. For every 6.8 pounds that you put into it, you only get a pound of meat out. Cultured fish is nearly one to one ratio. So you get in, you get out what you put in. What's not shown on here is shellfish, which is gonna be less than one because it's, it's just algae that you're putting in to feed them. And then what do you get for algae? It's, it's phenomenal. You don't put a thing into growing seaweeds and you get stuff out. So the other thing that's not really depicted on this graphic is aquaculture doesn't use a lot of our other natural resources like phosphorus, which folks are worried could be nearly depleted by the year 2050. And it also doesn't use a lot of freshwater resource. So it's, it's generally speaking a more sustainable way to move forward. China, Asia, mo most of Asia has moved that way. We are really slow to catch up to this trend. So if you look down at this graphic, as of 2011, most of the seafood in the world, half of it is fished and half of it is cultured. For the US, almost all of our seafood comes from international markets. So we have a huge trade deficit for seafood and we're behind in this aquaculturing world as the new technology is developing rapidly. However, aquaculture has a place in Maine many believe. Um, there are many investors and people watching the developing aquaculture and economy in Maine with lots of hope. So one more problem to introduce before we get to solutions. There is a lot of hope for us, particularly the shellfish aquaculture industry in Maine, but it is not without its own problems facing sustainable, um, sustainability in the future. So how many of you raise of hand have heard of ocean acidification before? Okay, when I started researching ocean acidification in 2009, no one raised their hand. So that's great that the word is getting out. But I think we can still do more in terms of educating people what the implications of it are and then starting to find solutions to this particular problem. So I'm going to escape out of here really quick and see if I can get a video to play. Excuse me while I do this. I just want you guys to have an understanding of the consequence of ocean acidification. So this is a sand dollar placed in, it's an extreme example, so it's some highly acidic seawater. But this is what happens to calcified organisms that are in seawater that has really low pH. The calcium carbonate um, skeleton structure can dissolve under really low pH, or at least it becomes very hard for them to calcify. Think that you're giving these shelled organisms osteoporosis. What does that mean for our industry? Let me get back to this. Okay. And what does that mean for the Maine coastline? Well, not only is Maine warming faster than anywhere else, but it's also more prone to acidification than other coastlines. Um, this has a little bit to do with the chemistry of our coastline. It's just got lower buffering capacity. That means for every bit of CO2 that goes into the water here, our change in pH is relatively more, more drastic than in other locations. It has something to do with um, uh, the, the alkalinity of our system and also with the freshwater input that we have here. We have a huge amount of freshwater input coming off of the state and that has an effect on seawater pH as well. Maine is both socially and ecologically vulnerable to acidification. I hope you could see this. I know it's really small. This is a really nice paper that came out um, about a year ago and what it did was map on the U.S. the balance between how dependent is that state's economy on shellfish fisheries coming off the coastline, and then what is the rate of change in ocean acidification along those coastlines? And then not only that, but what are those other factors that can happen there? Freshwater inputs, algae blooms. Maine sits in this perfect storm of we're pretty darn vulnerable. The changes 
predicted to, uh, that we predict to see will happen within the next 50 years. Some of us are recording it now, actually. Um, not only that, but we're pretty dependent on our shell fisheries and expect to be more so in the future. And then we have those river in, in, inputs. So if you add those things together, Maine's in a pretty tight spot. At the same time, our oyster industry, as well as other shell fisheries, are really developing. So um, Maine's oyster trail is, is becoming more of a public knowledge. Here is where we're sitting, is right there, if I can hold this steady enough. <laughs> this is the Damarascotta River. The Damarascotta River uh, produces 85% of the oysters coming out of Maine. It's actually a huge industry right here. We are not actually at um, capacity, ecological carrying capacity for the river. We could produce more oysters out of there. There are many that believe for now we're at social carrying capacity. People are seeing a lot of aquaculture out of there, out coming out of there, and they're still getting used to the visualization of oyster baskets on the river. Um, but it was once that way for Maine lobster buoys, and we certainly overcame that. <laughs> so the, the oyster trail extends all up and down the coast of Maine. And what I really want you to take home from this graphic is that it's not just that people are selling oysters. We have hatcheries that provide oyster seeds from Canada down to um, Maryland. Then we have all of the restaurateurs that are dependent on the oysters that are coming out of here. We have the ecotourism. And then some of the images I've been showing you tonight are from photographers who are making money off of selling images of these industries. So there, and then there's the scientists <laughs> who research what's happening in these industries. It's part of a building economy that can um, be really useful to Maine in a period where we're experiencing a lot of closures of other sorts of um, entrepreneurial endeavors. Okay, so how are oysters cultured? I'm going to give you a little primer. Well, you got to produce the oyster seed and you do that from broodstock and you have that broodstock kept in a nursery on shore. And you get that seed and we have a couple of seed producers here in Muscungus and in Damariscotta River. You can buy the seed from them if you're an oyster farmer. farmer. You put it out in these baskets or you can bottom plant it. And um, you know they've they've got their methods to keep predators away and to move it around to get to the best environmental conditions. But essentially, it takes about two years to get up to the size where you're going to pull it out of the water and then sell it. And you guys, I I think probably everybody who eats oysters recognizes the name Wellfleet or Blue Point. I mean that's that's kind of a traditional. <laughs> Oyster. Well, Damariscotta River is getting its name right in there, too. They're becoming just as popular and internationally renowned. I was able to convince my husband to move to Maine because he read about the Glidden Point oysters. <laughs> 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 and we live really not too far from them. <laughs> but oysters, especially at that seed stage, are especially susceptible to ocean acidification. And I can tell you that people on the river here now are already worried about it and already doing things to treat their water in the hatchery to protect their seed from acidification. But you still have to take it out of the hatchery at that point and put it into the water and it's still vulnerable. So what you're looking at is the development of that very tiny seed and how that essentially gets corroded in a higher, in a lower, higher acidity, lower pH. It's also true for mussels, and it's also true for clams, as well as a whole host of other shellfish organisms. And here, for the clams, you can see that in acidified muds, this is a, a simple handheld pH meter, you see evidence of pitting that happens um, in the shell as that dissolution is occurring in acidic conditions. So what does this mean for our wild harvest clamming industry? Because that's what we mainly have in Maine right now, it's just wild harvest clamming. Well, we have been seeing some steady drops in the clamming industry for a long time now. And people think that it's due to a whole host of problems, including the acidity, but also predation from the green crab outbreak that we've had. And there are also some forms of clam diseases that may be affecting those populations. Mussels uh, get whacked by ocean acidification actually in two ways. So it affects both their shell development, but it also affects the strength of their bissel thread. 
So that's the beard, you know, that you pull off. You don't want to eat that. But that's important to mussels because it helps them hold on to the substrate. For wild populations to that rocky shore, for your farm populations to the ropes that they're, they're grown upon. And the strength of that bissel thread gets weakened under acidified conditions, which means that they may not be able to hold on in a more acidic ocean. And even in Europe, uh, mussel farmers have remarked on mussels dropping off of their lines um, at a rate that's different than in the past, and they suspect ocean acidification might be the culprit. Okay, now I'm gonna get to the, <laughs> the problem solving part instead of just pointing out the problems. What can I do? Well, as a scientist, I started getting frustrated with only reporting problems, and I started to be very interested in trying to find a solution. Now, federal agencies, some cases will support, give funding support for this kind of applied research, but often not. So I'm left scrambling to figure out how to get this science accomplished. The general idea of what I'm trying to pursue is not an uncommon one. We know that the major problem is CO2 in the atmosphere and going into the ocean. We know that you can go out and plant a tree to try to absorb some of that carbon dioxide. That's a simple solution that everyone can do. Well, there are ocean forests as well. These are kelp forests off of the coast of California, but we have kelp growing right off the coast of Maine also. And in the research that I was doing at Scripps Institution of Oceanography with some master's students, we determined <laughs> that seaweeds like carbon dioxide. This isn't actually a very novel finding. They're photosynthesizers. That's just the basic process of photosynthesis, right? But we were having a really hard time maintaining our ocean acidification treatments in these experiments because we put the CO2 in and they'd suck it up. Okay, let's put more in and they'd suck it up. Oh gosh, how can we keep these conditions steady? We've got to, hey, wait a second. <laughs> this, is, this is an interesting concept. Could these guys be CO2 sponges in the environment. Then I went to a coral reef conference in Okinawa, and this was the view from my hotel room in Okinawa. Can you guys see all these faint lines back here? That's seaweed farms, and it's in ankle deep water out there. You could just walk out to instill these farms and then come back in. It's very low tech to put these farms in. And I started thinking, well, you could put those things anywhere. Hey, what if you could put them somewhere purposefully to absorb CO2? And how big is the seaweed aquaculture industry anyways? Well, I go to Taiwan and it's massive there. Oh, this next image is pretty big. It's gonna take a while. Of. You go to China and it's huge. Metric, metric tons of seaweed being produced. For the most part, the seaweed that they're farming here is used to extract carrageenan, alginates, other sorts of um, Com compounds that help bind our food. So it's actually in the toothpaste that you use. It's in the ice cream that you eat. It's in your chocolate milk. This is where it was first used is the chocolate cocoa kept drifting out of the milk and settling at the bottom. The carrageenan kept it suspended. And uh, so your yuhu was delicious. <laughs> Seaweeds are edible also, just in and of themselves. And I've tried to tempt your taste buds by placing out some of these seaweed products. It's not a common, um, common taste to the American palate, but it's, it's very common in Asian and European cultures to eat seaweed. Just as a side note, the seaweed farming industry is all based really on Dr. Kathleen Drew Baker. So there was a mystery as to how you got that baby seaweed, the seaweed seed. And it turns out that folks didn't understand until she started putting out papers in Nature back in the mid-1900s that seaweeds have two parts to their life cycle. They have a microscopic part and the macroscopic part. And everybody had been missing the microscopic part. And once she understood how that life cycle worked, it opened the door for um, seaweed cultivation in a captive kind of setting. And um, that is how we first got Porphyra farmed, and porphyra is the seaweed that's the nori. It's wrapped around your, your sushi, if you enjoy that. She is highly celebrated in Japan, and they have a festival for her every April 14th at a shrine. So what's happening with the seaweed industry in Maine? It's actually seaweed harvest has been a long time tradition in Maine. This is an image from 1882. That's from 
colonial folks who were using seaweed, right? But the Native Americans were harvesting seaweed long before that too, and using it as a fertilizer for their crops and also eating it. Maine is a proud host of the first ever US American commercial farm for seaweed. That was ocean approved. It opened in Casco Bay in 2009. There's now another seaweed farm right here in the Damariscotta River, uh, Maine Fresh Sea Farms. And actually there are more sprouting up, haha, <laughs> pun intended, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Along the coast of Maine, there are several pending lease applications um, at DMR as a, a result of some training courses that have been offered through the um, Maine Sea Grant and through the Island Institute, who I've also been working with, to start to offer seaweed cultivation as an option to lobster fishermen. These two um, fisheries are quite compatible. Seaweed farming happens during the winter season, which is the off season for lobster fishing. So, and it uses the exact same um, technological instruments, meaning a boat and some line. <laughs> it's really not that complicated to do. So um, it could be a supplemental income and it could be uh, another option um, to weather the storms of the boons and busts of the lobster industry. I'm really interested in how seaweed can be used as a phytoremediation strategy. So what I mean by phytoremediation is just seaweed's ability to biogeochemically alter the seawater that's around it. So by biogeochemically altering, I mean it sucks up carbon dioxide, it sucks up phosphorus, and it sucks up nitrogen as it's doing its daily duty of photosynthesis. And what I want to start to explore and have started exploring is how you can culture seaweeds and shellfish together to be mutually beneficial. So a couple of examples I've given here, and this is with work with the Island Institute. We are exploring how culturing sugar kelp with mussels, looking at rockweed harvest and oysters and eelgrass populations and, and soft clams can be paired together in space so that you get the net benefit of the halo created by the photosynthetic activity of those seaweeds and seagrasses on the shellfish so that the shellfish grow faster, they don't become pitted, and that fishery is also more sustainable moving forward into the future. So can farmed and harvested seaweeds remediate acidification to a sufficient degree to help ensure the sustainability of a shell fishery moving forward. Okay, I'm gonna show you some graphs now and I'm gonna to try to do my best to translate them. These graphs I'm gonna show you are results of lab experiments that I did with undergraduate students here in our REU program, which ended just about a week or two ago. Um, and I've done experiments last year and this year with students in the lab. The first was looking at four different species of seaweeds and seagrasses at a bunch of different levels of PCO2. So these levels mimic what we'll see, well, 200, that's a little bit of a misnomer, 280 PCO2 was pre-industrial. Today it's at 400, maybe even 520 on occasion. And then in 100 years from now, expect atmospheric PCO2 to be up to about 1120. So what's gonna happen to these seaweeds at these different, these different levels? Well, the sugar kelp, as you move up to these different levels in CO2, sucks up or takes out of the water more and more CO2. It really likes it. It turns out that it's CO2 limited, and the more you give it, the more it's going to take out. All of these species do that to some degree, but sugar kelp, by far, is the best CO2 absorber. This summer, we did some experiments looking at whether this ability to suck up CO2 was affected not only by the addition of CO2, but also warming. These two things are happening simultaneously in Maine. Well, these data depressed my student Holly here. She got a little upset, actually, because here's the seaweed's ability to suck up CO2 today. You see that it's getting removed. That's why the numbers are negative. But in a warmer ocean, they can't do it. They can't do it as well. So that's concerning for the wild population of seaweeds. But here's the glimmer of hope there. There are likely local adaptations to warmer conditions, and we know that there are seaweeds. If you take seaweeds from the southern limit and put them into the same experiment, they still perform this well. And so it's a matter of 
when we go to cultivate seaweed or um, build our husbandry uh, hatchery for essentially for seaweed, can we select for those individuals who are more resilient or resistant to this warming and can continue to perform their function in the future? And Bigelow can potentially help with that, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. The next question we went to was, okay, we have a good idea that these guys are pretty good at absorbing CO2, especially if we can get those individuals that are more resistant to warming, they can continue to absorb CO2 in the future, but that's in a jar in the lab. What happens out in Casco Bay, out in Damariscotta River? Well, in order to answer that question, we had to take some pretty fancy instruments that are pretty big, this is Paul Dobbins from Motion Approved, and put them in the water to measure a bunch of different parameters, and I don't expect you to understand all of those things, but you have to be very selective where you choose the sites to make these measurements, and essentially you put the suite of instruments right inside a seaweed farm, and then a suite of instruments just upstream of the seaweed farm, so that it's not affected by that halo created, it's outside of that halo, and you look at the difference between the two. And so we went out to the ocean approved farm with Paul to do this work, and those farms get put in in November, and we started this work in January, and that's very different than the work I've been doing in the tropics, I can tell you that. <laughs> the first day we went to put out these instruments, we had one of those big snowstorms with big white fluffy flakes, and it was just accumulating on our heads as we were trying to get the instruments in the water. So you've got to use equipment to sample from the water column, and this is my technician, Brittany Hanish, who's been helping out here, and this is Susie Arnold from the Island Institute. Um, doing the work. She's about three months pregnant there. She's pretty hardcore. <laughs> so we are handling these instruments. We're unplugging them and downloading them, see what they recorded uh, um, almost every two weeks, as often as we can get out there. And then at the same time, on that seaweed farm, we're measuring how big the kelp is growing over that time period. These guys grow so fast. I, I did a, a, a likeness. Um, I think they put on as much weight as baby elephants do proportionally as they're growing. They grow, that's why they're such good CO2 absorbers. They've got to use that carbon as building blocks to put on this huge amount of mass that they have. They can be 14 feet long in a matter of months. Okay, so these are two graphs essentially saying the same thing. It's just two different ways to look at the information. What's on the y-axis in either case is just a measurement of, um, of the acidity of the water. And so the higher the number, the less acidic it is. And you can think these numbers as a representation of the calcification potential for shellfish that are getting grown in that same area. And this red line here, that's a line that several scientists agree. Below that line, shellfish have a hard time calcifying. Above that line, they're in good territory. And what you see for the black is outside the farm, and for the green is inside the farm. So, shellfish inside or near a seaweed farm are experiencing levels of pH and this calcification potential that are on average 13 to 23% higher within that, within that farm. To put that in context, that's the same level or same magnitude of change that we expect due to ocean acidification. So here's your answer. It can buffer ocean acidification. Not only that, but the magnitude of that effect, so the difference inside and outside the farm, gets bigger and bigger as the seaweed gets bigger and bigger. So this, um, this is related to the biomass in a seaweed farm. And we could start to make back envelope calculations. Well, how much seaweed do I need to grow in order to get this kind of buffering effect for this many shellfish? Those are the kinds of calculations that we want to be able to make and help farmers choose how much seaweed they may or may not want to grow near their shellfish. Here's where else Bigelow is helping. And I mentioned this earlier in the context of um, husbandry to select for those individuals that are going to be more resistant or resilient to warming. So the mother of the sea determined that bipartite or two-part life cycle, the micro microscopic and macroscopic life cycle for seaweeds. 
That microscopic phase, we're really good at that here at Bigelow. That is our mission, right? And we have an entire center dedicated to phytoplankton, microalgae, macroalgae, the microscopic stages, cultivating the microscopic stages of those algae. And what we hope to be is the Burt's, be Burt's seed catalog, burpee seed catalog, sorry, for seaweeds going into the future. And we have methods that we're trying to develop um, for cryopreservation. Think of Austin Powers getting frozen, right, for a long time. We can do that too with seaweeds. And we can keep these seeds cryopreserved so that they can be called for on demand. We even already have an online ordering system. That's a credit card based kind of system. So people can come to us and order seaweed seed online. I just want to mention quickly that we also have been doing this work with non-edible stuff, with the eelgrass. So eelgrass in Casco Bay has been suffering a little bit over the past decade. Um, I hope you understand this graph, but where the green is, that's where the eelgrass cover is now. Where the red is, is where eelgrass cover used to be also 10 years ago. So we've lost about 50% of our eelgrass cover in Casco Bay in the past 10 years. That's probably also associated to the green crab outbreak and to the warming. What we're really concerned about is the loss of ecosystem services. And here's a bunch of jagged lines once again, just showing you that inside an eelgrass bed, you have higher pHs, better calcification potential than you do outside of the eelgrass bed. By the way, I forgot to mention, do you guys know what the byproduct of photosynthesis is? It's oxygen, right? So they're absorbing the CO2, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and they're also releasing oxygen, which also helps shellfish grow. They're more oxygenated. So phytoremediation as an adaptation strategy or a remediation possibility is really exciting to me because it could work. It really could work. A lot of folks, when I first was talking about this idea, said, no, you know how much seaweed you're going to have to grow to get that to work? Well, it turns out we can measure those differences right now on the size of a seaweed farm that's been in, um, in the field since 2009 and is working at a profit. So it is possible. Uh, what we don't know yet is how big that effect is. How wide is that halo? How much does it move around with the tides? How deep does it go? Because the mussel um, lines hang down quite a bit deeper than the seaweed does. And how consistent is it from one place to another? We've determined that it could work in Casco Bay. Is that true for Damariscotta River? Is it true for Penobscot? Is it true for anywhere further north? We don't know the answer to those questions yet, but I'm really interested in finding out. Not only can phytoremediation help buffer acidification, but it might be able to mitigate eutrophication. That's the science fancy word for nutrient loading, which is a big problem further south. And um, hypoxia is just low oxygen environments. By producing oxygen, it can help remediate that also. So I think it's very exciting. Some of the limitations are Americans don't really like to eat seaweed as part of their diet quite yet. But that doesn't mean that we can't be introduced to it. So um, I have some examples out for you to take a look at tonight. And even if you aren't amenable to eating seaweed yourself, you could start to think about using seaweed as a fertilizer for your own garden. It's a better way to fertilize the garden. It keeps the uh, system kind of more circular and uh, it works really well. It's amazing actually seaweed extract, seaweed tea you can buy, not only fertilizes the crops but it also somehow acts as a pesticide and we don't quite understand how that works yet but there are a lot of people interested in figuring that out. So I'd like to just end with what we're really interested in doing at the center is putting our science to work. We don't want it to stay on the shelf in the journal article. We want it to get out there and we want it to get used and used right away. And especially used right away in Maine to help the economy grow here. And at that, this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. <laughs>